warm thank you to the organizers of this winter school and conference, ably led here by Krish. It's a major uh, activity, a major, huge amount of work to organize this sort of thing, and warm thanks to all of them for the success of the speech. Secondly, let me say that although I'm going to do the talking, the work I'm going to talk about today is being done in collaboration with Andrew Mitchell, a former student of mine with whom I still collaborate actively. He's been a postdoc at the Institute for Theoretical Physics in Cologne for the last couple of years, and also with someone who needs no introduction here at all. And thirdly, and most importantly, of course, this conference is in, or, uh, in, in honor of Rama, or TVR, and that's not the first time that picture's been put up, Mohit put it up as well, but I like it because I think it shows warmth as well as wisdom. And in the time-ordered tradition of things, I join everybody else in taking my hat off to Rama, although quite why I had to put on a wig before I took off the hat is really anybody's guess. <laughs> now, uh, I'm going to talk today, this is an unusual talk for me. Normally I start with experiment, do some theory, and then maybe come back to experiment again. This is rather different in those terms, although hopefully, as you'll see as we go through, uh, there is an experimental motivation, very certainly, uh, to some aspects of the work. So I'm going to be talking about uh, aspects of two-channel condo physics in, in purity chains and rings. So let me begin just with a brief review of everything that's familiar to you about two-channel condo physics. It goes all the way back to the work of Nazir and Brandin in 1988. And of course, there's a problem that's extremely simply stated, consisting of the doors of a single spin and a half that's symmetrically condo exchange coupled to two equivalent non-interacting metallic leads. And this provides the simplest example of the phenomenon of overscreening arising generally with the number of screening channels n, here equal to 2, exceeds twice the spin. Now, in contrast, of course, to the regular one-channel condo effect, uh, where the stable fixed point is the relatively straightforward strong coupling fixed point, the stable fixed point here is an infrared fixed point, the two-channel condo fixed point, and the system exhibits a range of exotic properties in which at heart manifests the non-fermi liquid nature of the underlying ground state. For example, the impurity contribution to the entropy, entropy of the system with the impurity minus that without the impurity, the residual entropy is a value of a half log 2, and the uniform spin susceptibility is logarithmically divergent at low temperatures. Now, of course, the effect has ex been extensively studied uh, over many years, since time immemorial, the beta ANZAS, for example, by conformal field theory and by numerical organization group, both Sony and RG. In fact, the earliest calculations of that go all the way back, Friedrich Bozier really was in that paper, go all the way back to 1979. But the effect, of course, is delicate, very delicate indeed. It's completely destroyed by channel asymmetry if JK left is not equal to JK right. The fixed point is destroyed, you have a Fermi liquid state instead, or it's destroyed by interchannel co tunneling charge transfer in the language of quantum dots, to which I'll come back later. And it's for that reason, in large part, the delicacy of it, there's only really well, relatively recently that there's been unambiguous experimental evidence in the context of quantum dots for two channel condo physics following a very ingenious proposal by Yuval Oreg and David Goldhaber Gordon. Although I'm told that even that is now um, su su you know, suspect by a variety of people as to whether or not they really did see it, although I'm completely neutral in that. And indeed, the, the, you know, the, the delicacy of this shouldn't surprise you. It's a bit like a man who has two girlfriends, right? So each of the girlfriends wants to grab the man for herself and detach him from the influence of the other, but neither quite succeeds in detaching him from the influence of the, uh, of the other, and the result is delicate to say the least, and not to say possibly quite messy. And in fact, if one of the girlfriends got a slightly stronger hold of him than the other, if JK left to say greater than JK right, then ultimately she wins and grabs him with what you might call the infinitely strong embrace of the strong coupling fixed point, leaving the other poor soul in isolation here on the right. But enough of sociology. The Hamiltonian, of course, for the two-channel condom model is extremely simple. We have a, a pair of non-interacting metallic leads here, and we have the symmetric coupling of the spin one half to the spin densities of the left and the right orbitals, given in terms here of the usual orbitals for the Wilson chain for the left and the right lead, those orbitals themselves just being symmetric linear combination of the conduction band states. And it's going to be important to us here also to look at the case where a JK left is not equal to JK right, where the spin couples differentially to the left and to the right side with JK left and JK right. And just as a piece of notation, one tends to write this in the following form, namely a channel symmetric contribution where JK is a half the sum of JK left plus JK right, plus uh, an anisotropic contribution involving delta K one half the difference between JK left and JK right. 
So this talk will work in some aspects of two-channel condo physics in odd-membered uh, in pure spin one half impurity chains that themselves are internally antiferromagnetically coupled, and also in ring systems. It's very unlikely that I'll get to the stage of talking about the ring, so let me just say that in this ring problem here, which is manifest left-right mirror symmetry, there's a rather amusing quantum phase transition that arises in the problem between two distinct two-channel condo physics fixed points, two-channel condo fixed points that have different parity under the left-right symmetry, and it turns out that the, there's a very non-trivial quantum critical point in this problem on which one could get a, a very tangible uh, handle and study in some detail. But let me focus in on the odd impurity chains. So it has here spin one half impurity chains of length n, antiferromagnetically coupled, where n here is 1357. I can say nothing about if you like the thermodynamics limit of chain size here. Uh, these are antiferromagnetically coupled by an exchange coupling J. And then the n members are themselves condo coupled to two equivalent non interacting metallic leads, right, in the following fashion. Now, in order to understand this problem, it's not just good enough to study one, the stable fixed point. You need to start study a range of fixed points, and the flows between them are important in understanding this problem. And so the method of choice really has to be Wilson's NRG, which I shall use. And I'm going to look at the problem in five steps. So first of all, we're going to look at the case of large J. You may say large compared to what? Well, when J is nothing, right, you'll notice that the terminal end sites we exhibit one channel condo quenching to the respective leads. So there's a one channel condo scale associated with that process. And when I say J is large, I mean J is large compared to that one channel condo scale. So I'll first of all look at the case where uh, J is large. We'll look first of all at the channel symmetric case. Then we'll look at the more general channel asymmetric case. Then I'll look at the case where J is small, where the underlying two channel condo physics has a rather different origin, as we'll see. And then fourthly, I'll generalize to the case where the terminal end sites here, instead of being spins, are Andersonian-like levels with a, a level energy epsilon that in principle you could tune by a gate voltage and a charging energy U. And the charge of the chain could then vary continuously according to epsilon from n minus 2 to n plus 2. There are a variety of issues that one will be interested in there. And then finally, I'll say, what can we say about, you know, as it were, real quantum dot systems, where there will, 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 of course, be inter-channel, inter-lead, uh, co-tunneling charge transfer processes. And then for the last five minutes or so of the talk, um, I'm going to uh, pose a question that, that by that stage will probably be obvious in your minds and provide some sort of a, a, a partial answer to it. All right, so let's look, first of all, at the cases of, say, of strong inter-impurity coupling J here. And the first thing, only point you need to notice here is that if you look at the isolated chain itself, it's an odd member chain of spin a half impurities, antiferromagnetically coupled. And so the ground state of that chain is itself a spin one half object. And the excitations of the chain itself above the ground state are typically on the scale of J. So imagine here that if you're interested in uh, low energy physics less than on the order of the scale of J, then only the ground state doublet of the isolated chain is relevant. And in that case, one simply needs to take the condo part of the Hamiltonian and project it into the reduced Hilbert space of the ground state doublet of the inside chain via the appropriate unity operator for that subspace of the chain. And when you do that, rather immediately, you get an effective two-channel condom model where the operator S hat here is a spin one half operator for the lowest uh, chain doublet. And then the effective exchange couplings, and likewise effective anisotropies, are given by the bare JK, half JK plus JK left, or equivalently the bare delta K, times a matrix element that simply uh, reflects the Z components of the end spins in the ground state doublet of the end side chain. It is straightforward to work out the ratio JK effective over JK. It decreases as you increase chain size, as you might expect, although not dramatically so. All right. So let's begin then by looking at the channel symmetric case, where JK left is equal to JK right. We know in that case that the two-channel condo fixed point will be stable. As we put up in the scaling, you expect two-channel condo physics below a two-channel condo scale on the order of JK effective times e to the minus one over rho JK effective. Rho here is just the lead density of states, one over 2D. It's a flat band of width 2D. And D is by far the largest energy scale of the problem. And indeed, one sees this very clearly. If you look, for example, at the impurity contribution to the entropy, divided here by log 2 for convenience, 
This is a function of temperature at a log scale in units of the bandwidth D, the largest scale in the problem, for a range of different chains. N equals 1, 3, 5, and 7 are shown here. At high temperatures, if you're much bigger than the scale of J, the spins will all be free. So the impurity contribution to the entropy is then you expect going to be N log 2. Indeed, that's precisely what you see. But as you can decrease the temperature scale to something in the order of J, you approach an entropy here, which is itself log 2. That's the local moment fixed point, the local moment in question being the ground state doublet of the inside chain. And that represents an upper limit in terms of energy scales or temperature scales for the underlying two-channel condo model that one uh, conjectured there. And then, of course, as you decrease the temperature further, you flow from the local moment fixed point with its characteristic log 2 entropy to the two-channel condo fixed point with its characteristic one-half log 2 entropy on a two-channel condo scale, TK two-channel condo, that varies according to the length of the chain, 1, 3, 5, 7, and so on. And if you now take all this information and you rescale the entropy as a function of now T over TK 2K channel, which of course per itself differs for chains of different lengths, then one obtains from the local moment to two-channel condo fixed point crossover universality, and the scaling curve that you get there is precisely indeed that of the single spin two-channel condo model. I don't see similar behavior in, in various other physical properties. If I look, for example, at the uniform spin susceptibility as a function of T over TK to, to channel, we can again get universal scaling for different ends. And you see here, this is exemplifying the logarithmic divergence of the uniform spin susceptibility as T goes to zero, which is a characteristic of the two-channel uh, condo state. Now, in the following, the condo resonance is going to play an important role. The two-channel condo resonance here, embodied in the imaginary part of the scattering T matrix for lead alpha. Alpha equals left or right, it doesn't matter here. I'm considering the channel symmetric case. And I've shown it here uh, as a function of frequency relative to the Fermi level, omega equals zero, again on a log scale, and in units of bandwidth D, for chains of different length, one, three, five, and seven. And we'll notice that one has a, a characteristic so-called half-unitarity limit, to the condo resonance, it's one half here, a unitarity limit would be one. We'll think of the origin of that later on in the lecture, but that's a characteristic of the two-channel condo fixed point. And one's showing it here, as I said, for change of different length. And once again, if you rescale in terms of the distinct two-channel condo scales, you get universal scaling of the single particle spectrum, or excuse me, the condo resonance, as a function of omega over the two-channel condo scale. And what functional form does it have? Well, first of all, let's look at the case where omega is small compared to the two-channel condo scale, somewhere down here. Then uh, the leading asymptotic departure from the half unitarity limit is the characteristic square root form, uh, half of 1 minus a constant times the square root of omega over the two-channel condo scale. And that's the dashed line there asymptotically, persists up to omega of a small fraction of tk. But at larger values of omega over tk, what is the form of the uh, condo resonance? Well, it's in fact local moment scattering at very large energy scales, close to the local moment fixed point. This is the form of A over, asymptotically, A over some constant A over log squared of omega over TK, TK channel. That shouldn't surprise you. Here you're approaching the local moment fixed point. As you descend from the local moment fixed points, a la upper cause of, etc., the leading corrections are spin flip scattering processes, which you can sum up by leading parquet diagrams to get one over log squared. Uh, in terms of that sort. All right, and then finally, uh, one can also look at the two-channel condo scales per se for chains of different lengths, as shown here versus 1 over rho jk. Our argument was that tk to 2k channel should go with e to the minus 1 over rho jk effective. jk effective should be proportional to jk. That is clearly seen. Chains of different lengths have, of course, different condo scales, but they all collapse into a common form if you scale it in terms of the jk effective, which I gave you earlier. All right, so that's the channel symmetric case. Uh, what about channel anisotropy, where jk left is not equal to jk right? Well, in this case, of course, the two-channel condo fixed point is ultimately unstable. And you will have fairly liquid behavior on the lowest energy scales. Physically, the stable fixed point is either a strong coupling left, if jk left is the larger of the two condom exchange couplings, or a jk right. And you will obviously have maximal asymmetry when one or other of the condo exchange couplings is equal to zero, say, when jk right uh, is equal to zero. In that case, you will flow to the strong coupling fixed point, where the ground state spin a half is completely quenched to the left lead here. 
by a single channel condo scale, as indicated here. Now, as far as the anisotropy is concerned, if the channel anisotropy is very large compared to that single channel contour scale, then effectively the ground state spin doesn't care that it's coupled to the other weak lead. In which case, you expect to see direct flow from the local moment fixed point straight to a strong coupling from a liquid uh, fixed point on a scale which is a, a strong coupling condo scale. But by contrast, however, if your anisotropy, delta K here, is uh, less than or comparable to, and in the limit much less than this one channel condo scale, then you expect that you'll flow close to the two channel condo fixed point on a scale set by the two channel condo scale before crossing over to the stable ground state, the strong coupling left uh, fixed point, on a Fermi liquid scale that will denote by T star Fermi liquid. In other words, you expect to see a two stage quenching of the spin, but you'll flow close to the vicinity of the two channel condo fixed point, which is no longer the stable fixed point. And then one sees this very clearly in the entropy again. S imp over log 2 is a function of temperature in log scale. And I'm showing it here for an isotropy over the one channel condo scale of 100, uh, 10, 1, 10 to the minus 1, and so on. Uh, and this case, case H here, is just the two-channel uh, fixed point itself, where delta K is equal to 0. In terms of A and B here, A and B here, uh, where we have delta K much bigger than TK1, you can see clearly direct flow from the local moment fixed point straight through to the strong coupling fixed point, where we've completely quenched the entropy in the problem, on a scale TK strong coupling. But for the smaller values of anisotropy, we see, just as I suggested there, a, a two-stage quenching. So first of all, on a common scale, common to all of these cases, two-channel condo scale, we flow from the local moment fixed point in the vicinity of the two-channel condo fixed point. And then you descend from that, half log two, down to the vanishing entropy characteristic of a quenched spin on a Fermi liquid scale that progressively decreases the smaller the channel anisotropy is. And you can ask yourself, how does this Fermi liquid scale vanish as the channel anisotropy vanishes? And it does so in this characteristic delta K squared fashion, just as we know, in fact, from the single spin two-channel condo model. Now, the situation is, turns out to be rather interesting if you might now move, move to look at the two-channel condo resonance, because they will now be distinct for the left and the right leads. Because remember, the ultimate ground state here is a Fermi liquid. So I'm showing you the condo resonance here, again, as a function of omega, in units of the bandwidth d. For lead, alpha equals left or right. Uh, the solid lines here denote the left condo resonance, the dashed lines of the right condo resonance. And I've shown it for exactly the same range of channel anisotropies over single channel condo scale that we had for the entropies. So if you first of all look here, you can see that in all cases, in the left lead, you flow as t goes to zero to a strong coupling fixed point that's manifest in the unitarity limit for the condo resonance, just as you expect for a regular condo effect. But you'll see that whenever delta k is large compared to tk1, 100 or 10 times it for these two cases, there is direct flow to this stable strong coupling fixed point on a strong coupling condo scale that you can identify, say, from the half width at half height here. By contrast, if we go to the smaller values of delta k over the one channel condo scale, there are clearly two distinct low energy scales in the problem. There's a two channel condo scale on which, for both the left and the right leads, you flow up and in the vicinity of the two channel condo fixed point. And then there's a low energy Fermi liquid scale below which you flow respectively to the completely uh, um, uh, unitary limit here for the left lead, zero for the right lead, this ultimately being detached. So there should be, as it were, three scaling regimes in this problem. Um, and the first of them you can see when delta k is very large compared to tk1, but essentially the second channel is, is, uh, is utterly irrelevant. If one scales things here in terms of omega over tk strong coupling, cases a and b for example, then you see in fact a condo resonance that is precisely that of a single channel spin one half condo problem shown here in the circles. Its low energy behavior is ultimately a Fermi liquid, and the ultimate low frequency behavior then is that you descend to the strong coupling fixed point with a characteristic Fermi liquid form, omega over the low energy scale all squared. But the situation is more interesting when you look at the smaller values of channel anisotropy, because here we have two distinct scales, as I mentioned, 
two-channel condo scale and a low-energy Fermi liquid scale. And you can make this scale as small as you want by coming close enough to the channel symmetric point. So provided these two scales are well separated, you expect then to, to, to see two distinct scaling regimes in the underlying spectral behavior. So first of all, on a scale that's set by the two-channel condo scale, you expect to see for both the left and the right leads flow towards the two-channel condo fixed point with its characteristic half unitality limit. I mean, that's clearly what you're seeing here, focus of this curve here. And in this case, one gets collapsed for all the chains of different lengths onto a common universal scaling curve. And that is precisely, with the, with the circles here, precisely the condo resonance for a single spin one-half problem with this characteristic square root behavior here at low energy. By contrast, if we go to a regime where we look at scaling of universality in terms of this Fermi liquid scale, so energy is much, much below the two-channel condo scale, then you will see distinct scaling behavior for the left and the right spectra. Condo resonance is what are shown here. This is the left condo resonance as a function of omega of the, over the low energy Fermi liquid scale. We're flowing towards the strong coupling limit. The leading asymptotic behavior is, of course, that of a Fermi liquid. So this behavior is the quadratic behavior that is characteristic of a Fermi liquid. But equally, you can ask, well, what happens if you go to energy scales which are much larger than the Fermi liquid scale, but much less than the two-channel condo scale? Well, ultimately, you must flow close to the two-channel condo fixed point at its half unitarity limit. And indeed, you do, as indicated there. And dk right is just 1 minus dk left. And there's a very nice recent, uh, following this work, there's a very nice recent paper on a conformal field theory description of these crossovers in PRL by Aaron Sella, Andrew Mitchell, and Lars Fritz. All right, let, let me just one other point, because this will become relevant later. Let us say that for some reason, I was to look at half the sum of the left plus the right cardinal resonances, I wouldn't see any sign of the Fermi liquid behavior at all. I mean, put crudely, this upturn here exactly cancels this downturn. If I took the sum of the two, I would actually get this. I would actually get a two-channel condo behavior. That will become relevant later on. All right, now very briefly then, the comments on weak interim purity coupling. As I mentioned earlier, for j equal to zero, the terminal spins here, the interior spins are all decoupled, but the terminal spins are one-channel condo coupled to the respective leads. And the fixed point is, in essence, Fermi liquid like, or it is Fermi liquid like. I'll call it strong coupling times strong coupling times local moment, and just indicating that the terminal spins are respectively quenched to form strong coupling case states to their leads, and I'm left for the free local moment in the interior. And we know that this happens at a one-channel condo scale that we know for perturbative scaling is d root rho jk, e to the minus 1 over rho jk. So, so what happens when j is, well, asymptotically much less than that one-channel condo scale? Well, and let's focus on the uh, three-side chain. Here it is, and affirming that exchange coupling constants here. Then this is a schematic of the Wilson chain representation of the left lead and the right lead. The left zero orbital, the right zero orbital, one orbital on the left, one orbital on the right, etc. This is stuff I did in my school lectures, so the students will be familiar with this. But what happens, of course, is that if the one-channel, if your J is much less than the one-channel condo scale. Then the terminal purities, one and three in this case, will form single channel condo signets on a scale of the one channel condo scale, leaving the central spin two here at nominally free. But of course, that central spin can then acquire a residual antiferromagnetic exchange symmetrically to the remaining orbitals of the leads or with chains by a virtual polarization of the intervening condo signals. And so that, once again, applies that the effect of the letter model will be two-channel condo again. But with a JK effective that you can work out by a variety of perturbative arguments, this is proportional to J over TK one-channel condo. So if J is much less than that, this is much less than one. And this is a, an independent chain dependent factor that we can actually figure out and understand. And in that case, the effect of two-channel condo scale is then given by an almost familiar form, j tilde effective e to the minus 1 over rho times j tilde effective again, times a factor, which is the one-channel condo scale divided by the bandwidth b. And the presence of that factor, which is, of course, very small, reflects the fact that it's not until you've shrunk the bandwidth to an effective scale of the one-channel condo scale that the two-channel effective condo model is itself applicable. All right. And 
when one sees this, for example, this behavior I've been discussing, if you look at condo resonances versus uh, frequency again, uh, I've looked at it here for J over the one channel condo scale, 10 to the minus N over 10, where N goes from 0, 5, 7, 9, etc. Uh, this case here, for example, J is about a tenth of the one channel condo scale. Here, case A, it's equal to it. And in all cases, you can see there's an underlying one-channel condo scale. You could identify it from the half-width and half-height of this one-channel condo resonance that you see here. The stable fixed point is always a two-channel condo fixed point, but you descend to that from what effectively is a one-channel fixed point, RG flow in the vicinity of this strong coupling, strong coupling, local moment fixed point, reflecting one-channel condo screening of the terminal impurities before you flow towards the two-channel condo fixed point. And indeed, it's not very difficult to figure out what the skilling spectrum is. The effective spectrum is one minus a two-channel condo spectrum, the one reflecting the unitarity limit that you have before your effective two-channel condo model is valid. In that case, as we know that the two-channel condo model has a half unitarity limit with a negative uh, descent from uh, frequency, that we then get one half of one plus a square root term, precisely as you see if you look carefully at the scaling. All right. But so far, I've talked about uh, all impurity chains, where everything here is a spin, a spin one half. And now going to look at the case where the terminal end sites, 1 and N here, are Andersonian levels. So they have level energies epsilon and charging energies U. And the Hamiltonian reflects that. There's a, a level energy epsilon. The principle you could tune by gate voltage. A charging energy U. And the remainder of the sites here will be spins 1 half from the present. They're uh, anti fermi that they exchange coupled. And we'll also, of course, have tunnel coupling between the Andersonian-like levels at the beginning and end of the chain and the respective leads. And the strength of that tunnel coupling is, as usual, embodied in the hybridization strength. Gamma is pi v squared rho. Rho is the both the states of the leads at the Fermi level. So let us if we could tune here uh, our epsilon, our level energies, by gate voltage, then the charge in the chain could vary continuously from n minus 2 up to n plus 2. And so the questions here that we're interested in are, well, what happens to the two-channel condo state when we rely this variable charge by tuning an epsilon? And of course, experimentally, this would be relevant if we took, for example, the left lead and right lead, split them into two, applied a source drain bias across the system, either end here, it's symmetric, and drove a current through this Andersonian-like uh, dot coupled to its respective lead. And as one knows from earlier the important work by Meyer and Lindgren, the uh, temperature dependence of the zero bias conductance under these conditions is given very simply by the conductance quantum, 2e squared over h with 2 for spin degeneracy here, times the integral of minus df by the omega, f is the Fermi function, times pi gamma, the single particle spectrum of dot 1 or 3, and their equivalent, at frequency omega. So that if you go to the Fermi level, where minus df by the omega is a delta function that picks up uh, the spectrum at the Fermi level, omega equals a zero, that the conductance at the Fermi level is 2e squared over h times pi gamma, single particle spectrum at the Fermi level. All right. Now, if you look at the isolated chain here, for example, it, its charge uh, is, is integral. If it's completely isolated, the charge is integral. But it varies between 1 to 5 as you vary epsilon. This always carries a spin, but these guys are Andersonian levels and themselves can hold from 0 to 2 electrons. So the charge here will go from 1 to 5 as epsilon is varied. And if you tunnel a couple to the leads and are sufficiently deep in each of the essentially integral uh, n electron Coulomb blockade valleys, you can derive an effective low energy model via Schrieff and Wolf transformation, of course. And the resultant models are always of two-channel condo form. Now, that's pretty obvious as far as the odd electron Coulomb blockade valleys are concerned, because because they're odd, you naturally expect to generate a spin two-channel condo model. And, and indeed, you do, where S hat here is the uh, uh, spin one-half operator for the lowest chain spin doublet. But for n equal to four, for four electrons on the system here, the situation is a bit more subtle, because if you've got four electrons on this three-side chain, then the ground state is obviously a spin singlet. Right? So the ground state here is evidently a spin singlet. For example, sites 1 and 2 are uh, cu coupled into a local singlet, and I have another local singlet with two electrons on, on site 3. But of course, uh, it's a doubly degenerate singlet. For any configuration of this sort, I have one of that sort. And we can represent this by a pseudo spin. 
and I can think of this as the tor z equals plus one half the product of the pseudo spin, and that is the tor z equal to minus one half the product of this orbital pseudo spin. And then we work it out. The resultant low energy uh, model, two channel condom model, is an orbital two channel condom model involving these orbital degrees of freedom. Here is the orbital pseudo spin operator tor, and here are corresponding pseudo spin operators for the zero orbitals of the leads. We will notice that now spin plays effectively the role of the channel index in a spin two channel condom model. And so this is physically pretty obvious. Just think for a minute here of the, the tor minus component here, which will be with tor plus components here. Tor minus will take you from this state, tor z equals plus one half, to that state, tor z equals minus one half. And you'll notice that that appears to involve a transfer of charge from site three here to site one. There is, of course, no net transfer of charge across the central diagonal because it's a spin. And of course, that is immediately compensated for by the fact that tor minus goes with tor zero sigma plus, and tor zero sigma plus destroys in the left and creates in the right, ensuring, therefore, that there's no charge transfer in the system. So the effect of new energy models are always of two-channel condo form, spin in the hole, but uh, orbital two-channel condo as well in the uh, four-electron Coulomb blockade valley. And one knows what the two-channel condo scale should be, and one knows how to relate the effect of JKs here to the bare parameters of the underlying model. So you can then go ahead and look, for example, at the two-channel condo scales as a function of the level energy epsilon. Here are the various Coulomb blockade valleys, 1, 2, 3, 4, and 5, etc. And the points here uh, show you NRG calculations from the full model, and the lines are showing you what happens asymptotically from the effect of uh, two channel condo scales that I mentioned earlier. And you can see the agreement is always excellent, except obviously in the vicinity of these mixed valence regimes. Right? And that's natural enough because, of course, the Schriever Wolf isn't valid under those conditions. But there is, however, an elephant in the room because Throughout, for all our epsilon here, the two-channel condo fixed point is robust. There is no indication of anything other than a stable two-channel condo fixed point for all values of epsilon here, including the mixed field regimes. And so you might ask, well, what are the consequences of this? What are the consequences of this, as it were, for conductance? We would split these leads into two, pass a current through the terminal dots, and look at the conductance. All right. So it turns out this is rather interesting. If you want to understand the conductance, you obviously need to understand the single particle spectrum of either uh, one or three. It doesn't matter which. And then let's have a look at the single particle spectrum. That's just minus one over pi times the imaginary part of the associated green function, which for the dice of is just G1 inverse is G10 inverse minus itself energy, where G10 is the non-interacting limit for the propagator. By non-interacting, here since it's just a single resonant level, right? It's not interacting, and by non-interacting, I mean u is equal to zero, of course, and j is equal to zero. But just as a matter of algebra, if you just work through this, decompose sigma into a real and imaginary part, then g1 at the Fermi level is just one over minus epsilon star plus i gamma star, where epsilon star is the bare level energy, plus the real part of the self-energy at the Fermi level. That's a normalized level, precisely as you're familiar with with low-frequency expansions and regular Anderson impurity models. Likewise, gamma star here is what I'll call the renormalized hybridization. It's the bare hybridization plus the imaginary part of the, of, of the self-energy at the Fermi level. For a Fermi liquid, that would be zero. This is not, a, however, a Fermi liquid state. We have no reason to, to suppose that it should be zero. And then, of course, just by definition here, the single particle spectrum at the Fermi level is minus 1 over pi times the imaginary part of it. So we can write that, and remember this object is the conductance at zero temperature and units of the conductance quantum is gamma over gamma star, 1 over 1 plus the square of the renormalized level over the renormalized hybridization. Now, you can determine the frequency dependence of the real and imaginary parts of the self-energy from NRG. And for energy scales that are low compared to the two-channel condo scale, mod over U over 2K, uh, TK two-channel condo much less than one, you find asymptotic behavior of the sort at least partially you would expect, namely that the real part of the self-energy and the imaginary part both descend to their Fermi level values with a characteristic square root behavior, square root in omega over the condo scale. 
if for all epsilon, one finds that the real part of the cell's energy tends to minus epsilon, where epsilon is the level energy, and the imaginary part of the cell's energy tends asymptotically at the Fermi level to the bare hybridization gamma itself. And so what this means is that for all epsilon, wherever you are, whether you're at essentially integral electron complicated valleys or whether you're in a mixed fluid regime, the renormalized level, which is the bare level plus the real part of the self energy at the Fermi level, vanishes. In other words, the renormalized level here is pinned ubiquitously at the Fermi level. And that's, of course, well known in the signal channel case in a Ponder regime, but here it's absolutely ubiquitous for this problem. And likewise, one finds that gamma star is uh, the renormalized hybridization. The bare hybridization plus the imaginary part of the self energy at the Fermi level is twice gamma. So since epsilon star is nothing for all values of bare epsilon, all charges in this system, and since gamma star is 2 gamma, one has a major way of understanding why it is at the Fermi level you get the half unitarity limit for the single particle spectrum and in consequence for the conductance. So indeed, for this characteristic low frequency behavior here, one's getting generically that you have this square root approach to that, um, that, that uh, half unitarity limit. And this is seen very vividly in all of the single particle dynamics that you could look at. I'm showing you pi gamma d1 of omega here versus frequency in units of the hybridization strength at a very large energy scale. Sitting in the middle of the three electron coulomb decade valley, this is a particle hole symmetric point. These are clearly particle hole symmetric Hubbard satellites. Sitting somewhere in the four electron coulomb decade valley, not, not in the center, it's actually close to the edge. And the five, and you'll notice in the five case, for example, almost all the spectral density is below the Fermi level. That's what you'd expect. Five is the maximum charge that you could actually have on this, uh, on this problem. But in all cases, the key point is to note that you have this half unitary limit for the conductance or for the single particle spectrum at the Fermi level zero itself. And the scaling behavior of the spectrum in all cases follows the canonical form that we discussed earlier, regardless of what the bare epsilons actually are. And if you look at that, then of course what that means is that you have a half unitary limit for the conductance at zero temperature throughout. And if you want to interrogate the temperature dependence, once again, you have this characteristic square root approach to the half unitary value of conductance. Now, you can ask yourself, what are the implications of the fact that the signal particle spectrum is always pinned to this half unitarity limit? And there are various of those. One is a free loss not to assemble, which is an exact thing. I'm not going to really skip this in the interest of time here. But the second implication I just want to mention is really, what about the phase shifts for this problem? How does the S matrix behave? All right, how does the S matrix behave? Well, the S matrix for scattering of electrons, through here, this way, be written as e to the 2i two, uh, two delta, with a phase shift delta that can be separated into a real plus i times an imaginary part. And the S matrix is related to the propagator G1 by S equals 1 minus 2i gamma times G1 of omega. And so just as a trivial identity, since the signal particle spectrum is minus 1 over pi times the imaginary part of G1, I can relate pi gamma D1 purely to the imaginary and real parts of the phase shifts. And there it is, 1 half of 1 minus e to the minus twice delta i times cos twice delta real. Now just notice here, uh, amusingly, that if delta i were to vanish, this is 1 as a trigonometric identity, pi gamma D1 of omega is then sine squared delta real of omega if a delta imaginary vanishes. And that, of course, is precisely the situation you have if you have a Fermi liquid. Whereas you approach the Fermi level, the imaginary part of the scattering phase shift vanishes, and you have that pi gamma d1 of, of 0 is then just sine squared times the phase shift at the Fermi level, which itself is related to the by the free sum rule to the change in uh, charge of the system induced by addition of the impurity. Of course, the system is not a Fermi liquid. It's not a Fermi liquid, uh, but you'll notice also that if delta imaginary of omega went to infinity, whence this second term completely vanishes, that the pi gamma d1 of omega would go to a half. So turning that into its head, since we know that for omega equal to zero, pi gamma d1 of omega equal to zero is equal to a half, this is telling us that the imaginary part of the phase shift as you go towards the Fermi level is divergent. And that divergence simply reflects the fact that you no longer have a single particle scattering picture at low frequencies, and incoming electron breaks up into collective excitations. And moreover, because we know that the leading departure from the half unitarity limit in the spectrum has this square root behavior in omega uh, over TK 2, 2K channel, and because we have an e to the minus 2 delta i here, it follows directly that the imaginary part of the phase shift must be minus a quarter times the log of omega over TK2K. All right. Now finally, 
let me comment briefly on real quantum dot systems. We've looked so far at the case where these guys are exchange coupled, but in real quantum dots, of course, they're actually tunnel coupled with tunneling T. So even for left-right symmetric systems, the two-channel condo fixed point will be rendered unstable by these interleaved co-tunneling charge transfer terms, and you will have cross over to Fermi liquid fixed point on some low energy scale T Fermi liquid. So what can we say about that kind of a problem? We first of all remember a familiar fact, which is that a single impurity Anderson model coupled to two leads does not exhibit two-channel condo physics. This is familiar at the level of the street for wolf transformation. There are many ways to see it. I gave one example in my school lectures, but another way to see it is right at the level of the street for wolf transformation, where you separate the problem into the leads plus a condo type Hamiltonian. And the condo type Hamiltonian for arising from street for wolf could be written in terms of two components. One is a channel symmetric piece, channel symmetric contribution. And the second, where, where, where you know, your s left zero and s right zero are as usual, you know, the spin densities of the left and right leads at the origin may involve solely the uh, f orbitals for the left or right leads, plus a piece that physically describes co-tunneling charge transfer between the left and the right leads, and where the s left right zero here involves destroying the right creating of left or destroying the left creating of right. This involves interlead co-tunneling charge transfer. Now, all you have to do at this stage is make a transformation from the left-right basis to an even odd basis for the lead state's characteristic symmetric or anti-symmetric combination to form new f orbitals. And when you do this, the condo Hamiltonian becomes jks dot now s even plus s odd plus j left right s dot s even minus s odd. The only point I want to make here is that for the single impurity Anderson model, rather obviously j left right is equal to jk, in which case coupling to the odd channel completely drops out. This is a problem in which you couple solely to the even channel. It's a one-channel condo problem. You therefore have one-channel condo physics only. But now when we move to odd dot systems with three or more uh, uh, sites or dots in the chain, you expect to have exactly the same form for the underlying effect of uh, problem, where S here and I denotes the spin a half for the lowest chain doublet, exactly the same form where the J left right here again embodies through tunneling charge transfer between the leads, but with your J left right not equal to JK. In fact, simple parallel counting would suggest that J left right is down in JK by 2 over U to the power n minus 1, where it is the number of sites in the chain. And then once again, transform into even and odd channels. Of course, precisely the way we did there for the singular purity case. You see that the problem here now becomes a channel asymmetric two-channel condo model, where you expect the two-channel condo fixed point to be visible on intermediate energy scales, provided J left right is sufficiently small compared to JK. And indeed, one sees that in the entropy as you would expect, S n over log 2 versus the temperature for a range of different J left rights embodying the intermediate co tunneling charge transfer to JK of 1, 10 to the minus 1, 10 to the minus 2, etc. And this is the pure two channel condo line where J left right is equal to 0. The stable fixed point is always, of course, a strong coupling fixed point. You, however, will flow in the vicinity of the two channel condo fixed point as you decrease the energy scale. Common two channel condo scale, fairly liquid scale, progressively diminishing as your interleaved co tunneling charge transfer gets smaller. But now, if you actually look instead at the spectrum, now this is a channel symmetric case that I've looked at, so the left and the right spectra are the same as each other. You went for something of a surprise. Here's the spectrum versus the frequency. And as you can see, the Fermi liquid scale is not, in fact, apparent. Uh, if I look at cases C to G, which are precisely the same as C to G here, they're all indistinguishable from each other as a function of frequency. And this reflects the fact that the problem we have here is channel asymmetric in the even and odd channels. So if I want to construct the left or right spectrum, I have to take a combination of the even plus the odd, and the upshot of that, rather ironically, is that the Condi resonance is effectively blind to the Fermi liquid crossover that is induced by small interlead co-tunneling charge transfer. And the two-channel Condi fixed point then appears to be stable on the lowest energy scales, even though we know it's not. In other words, ironically, the crossover out of the non-Fermi liquid regime is not, in fact, apparent. Now, uh, first of all, maybe I maybe have just one minute to mention one point. I'm not going to say anything about it. The one question that you may have in your minds is, 
Why has he been talking about odd member chains? Well, it's to get a handle on the two-channel quantum physics. But what about even member chains, of which the obvious canonical model would be two impurity condo, right? which is two spins one half, right? which are themselves a condo exchange coupled to right and left leads, and mutually antiferromagnetically coupled by J. The Hamiltonian for that is familiar, and you'll notice that J equal to zero, we once again have a doubled spin one half condo problem with a condo scale TK. And the physics of this is quite well known, a long study, it goes all the way back to work by Jaya Prakash, Krishna, Murphy, and Wilkins in 1981. It's been quite extensively studied. There's a condo singlet phase when J is sufficiently small compared to a critical value. These guys are condo screens with respective leads. There's a local singlet phase where these guys glom up and drop out of the problem when J is greater than J prime critical. And a quantum phase transitions here occurs when the JC is in the order of TK. Uh, with a non-trivial infrared critical fixed point, the two impurity condo critical fixed point. Now, people know that there's some connection between these fixed points. They have different properties on the one hand, similar properties on the other. Do I have two minutes to, 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 to carry on that? Okay, so let's just compare two channel condo and two impurity condo. Two channel condo again, everything that we've discussed so far. Remember that the two channel condo fixed point is destabilized by any channel anisotropy. Secondly, remember that this is a characteristic residual entropy of a half log 2 and a log divergent uniform spin susceptibility. Thirdly, note that the finite size spectrum, which is the spectrum of energy levels that characterizes this, this fixed point, is characterized by a set of fractions. Never mind what those are, it's not important. And finally, let me also notice that the asymptotic T matrix and hence conductance as a smoking gun from the viewpoint of experimental square root behavior, either in the source of bias over temperature or temperature over the two channel condo temperature itself. Now compare that to two impurity condo. Here, the two impurity condo critical fixed point is entirely stable to channel, channel anisotropy. You can make JK left very different from JK right. The fixed point is still completely stable, something that wasn't appreciated until really quite recently. But it has a characteristic residual entropy of one half log two again, uh, but it has a finite uniform spin susceptibility as the temperature goes to zero, at least in the uh, channel symmetric the finite size spectrum of the two impurity condo critical point is characterized by a set of fractions here, but a different set of fractions than for the two channel condo problem. And finally, while I mentioned that the two impurity critical point is stable to channel anisotropy, it's actually independent of channel anisotropy. You get exactly the same fixed point in all cases. It also amusingly happens to be independent of spin S. So what's the connection between the critical fixed points? And all I want to point out at this stage, and there's a conformal field theory proof of this, so I'm obviously not going to say anything about that except to state it, which is that the two impurity condo and the two channel condo critical fixed points are entirely equivalent. They lie in exactly the same marginal manifold parameter simply by potential scattering. In other words, you can relate directly the critical fixed point of one model with potential scattering, say, V left, V right, to that of another model, the other model, with different potential scattering. They're fundamentally the same fixed points, and we can prove this, as I said, using CFT. But if you look at the signatures of two impurity criticality and conductance, right, they're very different. Because there's some connection between these fixed points, people looking for two impurity condo physics experimentally have assumed that you will have something like a half unitarity limit with a, a square root approach to it. In fact, that's not generally correct at all. Now, the signatures of two impurity condo criticality reflect RG flow to the critical fixed point from higher energy fixed point, and those depend very sensitively, say, in parity breaking and so on. They're much more subtle than the square root smoking gun behavior that you expect in two channel condo physics. And indeed, for the standard channel symmetric two impurity condo model, the widely expected square root behavior in two impurity condo as for two channel condo is provably absent. And the asymptotic conductance is, in that case, linear in the source strain bias or temperature. All right, so let me just skip directly to the end there because there are people that I actually want to thank. I'm obviously not going to get through the rest of this. I didn't think I really would anyway. Uh, and the people that I want to thank are uh, people from my own group who've enlightened me a lot on these kinds of problems. My colleague Fabio Nessler at Oxford, uh, Aaron Seller, who uh, we've collaborated with in the last paper we saw there, Ian Affleck and Mark Butelar from the Cavendish, with whom we're collaborating on experimental aspects of to impure the Anderson model devices. Finally, funding from EPSERC, UKIERI, and let me not forget the reason why we're here. Happy birthday once again, Rama, and thank you for your attention.
be physical or mathematical. <laughs> I do not believe that there has been any realization in reality of two-channel condo, except for this one ex uh, quantum dot experiment. David, Zawadowski company wrote well, it's extremely controversial. I mean, there are those who believe it has been seen, and there are those who believe it hasn't. I really think the only experimental efforts that I know for two-channel condo really is this quantum condo. So my question but was, okay, yeah. suppose you change the SU2 spin rotation of the reduce it. Yeah. Will it survive? Because in that problem, there is no rotational invariance. It's, not, it's only a pseudo spin with some. So, what, what do you want me to do? Instead of spin a half, what do you want me to do? Well, you have a spin half, yeah. but the coupling is not isotropic. It's not S dot S. Yes. So oh, you mean you may make it spin that isotropic? That All right. It's I, uh, two channel condo is stable to spin that isotropic. It's unstable to channel that isotropy, so but it's stable to spin that isotropy. Right? And indeed, one knows this because, yeah, it is. Right? So uh, it, it, it channel anisotropy, it's unstable too, but spin anisotropy, it's perfectly stable too. That will system. It was spin anisotropy. Yeah. Uh, well, they saw two channel combo. Right. Well, uh, so that's consistent with, with what I've just said to you there, because it's completely stable to that. Although, as I say, I think. Well, I, I don't think it's just me. I, mean, I think there's a general view that th there's only one case where it's arguably been seen, and even that I'm told is not controversial. Uh, well, you can do that actually by looking at the uh, a two purely Edison model, a two purely carbon model at high magnetic field, right? Where you can make a spin on an effect because you've got a, a triplet in the signal. You would pull down a, 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 a one of the triplet components, the signal. So I'm talking about the local signal phase, and I will then generate an object which is a spin a half like object, but which is um, channel a spin anisotropically coupled to its surroundings. So one could actually realize that in quantum, one should be able to realize that in quantum dot devices as well, just of the sort that would be discussed here. Are you going to shout, Chris, because we can hear you? I <laughs> arrives. Thank you. Um, so forgive me a, a technical question, but it's one that's always interested me. My notes. So, so this is about the instability of the two-channel condo fixed point to co-tunneling coupling between yep. the leads. Yep. One way I could think of investigating that is to look at the conformal field theory for the two-channel condo fixed point and introduce the operator that describes the co-tunneling yes. and ask about its scaling. Yes. Yes. Does, that, does that show an instability? So, so, so it's like there's been a controversy about this in the literature over the summer. So Ian Affleck and Justin Malecki and Aaron Sauer put out a paper starting from the two impurity Edison model saying to leading order of three for Wolf, it's two impurity condo when doing just this, that you should be able to see two, two impurity condo physics, right? Uh, however, they hadn't done Frank, I mean, they've done a conformal field theory wrongly, in the sense that if you do a proper tree for Wolf transformation and go to third order, right, there is a contribution to the co tunneling charge transfer that is a rather unusual uh, form that involves a Jalasinski Maria like interaction. Right? And they hadn't included that in their problem. Now, it turns out I'm told that when you do, it all works out, and you can't see two impurity condo physics, which is pretty consistent with what I'm saying here. Uh, but they hadn't included in that instance. And what we did was we went to a two impurity Edison model, did the three for growth properly. They did RG properly on the leading corrections. And when they then did their, their conformal field theory on this fairly recently in collaboration with Aaron, uh, it agrees precisely. So you can put that in the conformal field theory. That is a way to do it, and that's precisely what they've reasoned. Thank you. Right. Which, uh, uh, yeah. going and then the summer, so yeah. this is useful. Well, I mean, that, that was the origin of why, ironically, uh, when you looked at the co tunneling charge transfer, right, you ended up not seeing the Fermi liquid fixed point that you know was actually there. Right? Now, it, I was talking about earlier the left right representation. Remember, the left went to the unitarity limit, the right went.